Good morning, church. How I've missed you. It feels like we haven't been together for almost a year. Uh, I'm that old. I make that joke now. But it is such a joy to see you in this new year and just to uh, see what God has for us in the days ahead. Uh, you know, I'll be real honest with you. We're only seven days into 2024, and I, I look out uh, amongst the group here today and, and some in first service as well uh, that I know you've already gone through some hard things even in a short amount of time. And even this morning, I got a message, just uh, a precious saint in the Lord, one of our uh, dear members passed away this morning. And, uh, you know, it's just it, it, life never stops. And as we approach this new year and venture into what God has for us, is anybody else thankful that although this year may have new, new opportunities, which can be exciting, but new challenges, new struggles to figure out and find our way through, with all the ways life changes, can anybody else rejoice with me that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? That's what I'm so thankful for. So we trust our life to him because you never know what life's going to throw at you, but you know that Jesus is, is real and he really loves you. And this morning we're starting a brand new message series entitled Life Changing Life. And as a pastor, I just want to be very honest with you. There are two moments that I really love to see more than anything else in God's people. First of all, of course, is the moment that your life is radically changed by the saving grace of Jesus Christ. That's, that's a huge deal. But if I could confess to you, specifically as, as one who is called to equip the saints for ministry, that's really my role as a pastor, uh, is not to entertain you with my ministry, but to equip you because you have a ministry. Amen? So uh, just as important to me is not just seeing your life change, but watching you grow and mature and to step out by faith and step into the life that God has for you. Because not only has he changed your life so that you can go to heaven, but he's changed your life so that you can go to the grocery store, to your family, to your, to your neighbors, and be a, a life that God uses to change others' lives. If anybody believes that, would you give Jesus a big amen right there? <laughs> Praise God. That's what our goal is, and I'm so excited you're here. I, I know God has given me a word for the church today, and, and I also want to greet those that are watching online. I'm glad you're here with us as well, and you're a part of us, and wherever you're at, Jesus is with you, and you're a part of his plan. Would everybody join me? Would you put your hands together for those on the live feed? We love you, and we're glad you're with us. Because this is not supposed to just stay in a building or in like a nice little hour or so long segment. This is to be lived. And I want to give you just some reminders of some things we are doing to try to equip you and empower you and, and resource you in this year ahead that I hope you'll utilize. First of all, something you can do today is hang out after service for just a little while for our life group leaders meeting. It's going to be happening here in Iowa Park and at our Vernon campus. It won't take long, but it's very important. And if you're interested at all in leading a life group or maybe co-leading, being an assistant to somebody so you can kind of learn on the job, uh, these are life-changing moments. Real life change happens in these small groups where people will open up more and have time to share what's going on. And so I'd love for you to just prayerfully consider checking that out and being part of that. Uh, you can find out more at lakeviewpeople.com slash life. And that's something you can do today. And today is also the, the launch of our 21 days of prayer and fasting. We do this uh, every January. We set aside this first part of the year to seek God. Because how I many of you know we need Jesus all year. And we want to make sure that he is priority in all that we do. We've got some daily prayer focuses. And on Sundays, we don't meet at a separate time. This, this worship service is just our gathering on Sundays. But we want you to be praying. And there's a daily prayer focus during 21 days, even uh, for today. And I want to read the scripture to you. It's not in your notes or on the screen. Just listen to the word in James chapter 1, verse 5. This is our focus for today as we're praying for guidance and wisdom. It says, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God. Anybody else glad we serve a generous God? And he will give it to you. So if you need wisdom, ask him. He will give it to you. It says, he will not rebuke you for asking. 
And sometimes the Bible says we have not because we ask not. So I'm asking God to give us wisdom as we enter into this important time, these 21 days of prayer and fasting just as a corporate body. I'm believing for God to speak to you and to give you the wisdom to not only hear his words speaking to your heart, but to know how to put them into place, to give you the wisdom to to put them into action and to not only hear his words, but do what he tells you to do. And uh, the, the powerful thing about 21 days of, of prayer is it's personal. It, you can do it you know, however God leads you. There's tips about fasting and stuff on our website, lakeviewpeople.com slash prayer. You can submit prayer needs there as well and, and uh, find out the schedule. We're going to be meeting every Monday through Friday starting tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. And I would love for you to be here. In Vernon, they're going to be meeting on the second floor of the Herring Bank. We rent office space there in Vernon. Uh, we're still portable there at the church, but I just, I, I want you to know I, these times are so valuable. So Monday through Friday, 6 a.m., Saturdays at 9 a.m., then Sundays we just meet together at, at church. But I pray that you would be involved as much as you're able, and it'll be live streamed as well so you can participate if, if work or school schedules don't allow you to be here. But I also uh, want to let you know of something that you can do, not just today or during these 21 days, but that I hope you'll do every day, and that's read God's Word. And y'all, we're without excuse. I found an app that will read the Bible to me, and I can even make it sound like Morgan Freeman's voice. Hallelujah. <laughs> so cool. I've got like my own personal narrator. I do it while I'm driving or whatever, and I want you to get God's Word in your heart because it will transform your heart. It will change your life. And we want to live out what God has told us to do in his word. And that's kind of the heart of today's message is about being a living influence. That's the title of today's sermon is Living Influence. Uh, We live in a different society than even when I was in school. Uh, Anybody remember life before Facebook? Wasn't it glorious? I didn't know all your business and you didn't want to know all mine. Uh, but it, it is what it is, and in the world of social media, now you know it's branched out to many different things, there's a term uh, that you may have heard for people that get like a big following on social media, people call them influencers. And brands and companies will actually pay them to promote their products because they know what they say or what they're seen wearing or where they're seen eating, that will influence other people to buy what they bought or do what they're doing so they have big influence. And I don't want the thought to creep into the church that the more followers you have, the more influence you have. The reality is the better follower you are, the more influence God will give you. And so we want to live a life that is a life-changing life. That It's not just about our life was changed, but our life is being used to make a difference in the lives of others. And it talks about it all throughout God's Word. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 15, and I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but look at it when you can on your own time. Jeremiah starts off just complaining. Jeremiah is a prophet, and he's just complaining about how bad people are, how bad the world is. Anybody ever felt like that? Jeremiah battled, uh, he battled depression, he battled you know, anger and all, all the things, all the emotions I'm sure we all go through. And he's just telling God how bad people are, how bad religion is, how bad uh, the government is, yada, yada, yada. And I've been there. Any real people ever been there? You just feel like, you know, I can't believe it, but I'm just griping and complaining about everything. I feel like the older I get, the more I complain about things. You know, it's funny, I did this the other day, y'all, I will be 40 years old this year, 40 years young, hallelujah, (laughs) and I told y'all before, I I had a thing happen to me recently I never thought would happen, I made a noise involuntarily when I was getting out of a chair, (laughs) it happens, it happens, and as the older I get, you know, things kind of hurt, and you're walking through, you know, and you get just where, you just start, now I'm doing the thing I used to laugh at my parents for doing, I'm talking to the TV, like they can hear me. My God, it's so stupid what they just said. You know, I can't believe that politician's doing that. You know, just like, like that's doing anything. Jeremiah's doing that. He's just running his mouth, complaining, bad-mouthing stuff. And here's God's response. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 15, this is how the Lord responds. If you, he makes it personal. Sometimes we're so worried about everybody else, we don't realize we're not doing much ourselves. So he's complaining about, he was complaining about a lot of stuff. And God said, I want to talk to you about you. 
If you will return to me, I will restore you so you can continue to serve me. If you speak good words rather than worthless ones, you will be my spokesman. We want to really speak for Jesus. We need to make sure we're cautious and careful and thoughtful and listen for what he says. Because he says, you must influence them. Do not let them influence you. And too often in life, we care so much about what people think of us, we let what people think of us change how we think of ourselves or how, what we think we're supposed to be doing. And the Bible says we're supposed to be influencers, not be influenced. And I want to show you an example of it in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, but we will not boast beyond limits, but we'll boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us to reach even to you. He's writing to the church. He's saying, really, my area of influence is right here in front of me. It's, it's you. It's my friends and family in the faith. And he says, we're not going to boast beyond our limits. We're going to focus on what God's called us to do. This is where our influence is. Verse 14 says, for we are not overextending ourselves. Anybody ever felt overextended in life? You, I'll just tell you the truth. If you feel like you don't have enough hours in the day, that's because you're doing things God's not asking you to do because he knows exactly how much time you have. And he would not ask you to do something that he would not give you enough time for. So we need to evaluate. Don't overextend ourselves as though we did not reach you. And what he's saying, don't overextend so that you're missing the things you're really supposed to be doing. Because so many times we'll stay so busy. I heard somebody say this. It was so powerful to me. They said, the enemy of love is hurry. That we're in such a hurry, we don't stop and take care of the ones that we really should be taking care of. We don't really notice the ones that we really love the most. And we say we're doing this for our family, we're doing this for our loved ones, our friends, our neighbors, but we don't even spend any time with them. We've overextended. And so he, so he goes back to the first things. He says, because we were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. Y'all are important to us, he's saying. Then look at the next Verse of scripture, we do not boast beyond limit in the labors of others, but our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged. So what he's teaching here is a powerful thing for the church to realize. He said, we're not just trying to get more people to come to church, we're trying to get more people to go be the church. And I'll confess to you as a pastor, there's a temptation that, I, that I've battled that I find my value in how many people show up to hear me talk. But the Holy Spirit has been dealing with my heart that it doesn't matter how many people are coming to church as much as it matters how many people are stepping up, stepping out in faith and learning to be, to grow and go to where God has called you to be in influence. Because it's saying if you get that, our area of influence will be greatly enlarged as your areas of influence. Are enlarged. You're so important to God's plan in this earth. You're so important to God's plan for your family, for your sphere of influence. And I just want to encourage you with this message to, to let your mind be open to what God's word says he wants to do in you and through you. And it says we do all this in the, the final verse here so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you, without boasting of work already done in another's area of influence. And sadly, in the American church today, most church growth, did y'all see my fingers there? Church growth is people just leaving one church and going to another one. They're saying, well, they didn't entertain me as well over there, so I'm going to go over there. They didn't sing what I like to sing over there. It was too hot or too cold. The preacher was too long or too short or whatever it might be. And that's not growing the kingdom at all. I want to see something we've made a commitment, our church leadership, is we're more focused not just on church growth as our measure of success, but on church health. Because how many of you know healthy things grow? So we want to invest more in you because you are the church. We, we want you to take responsibility and take initiative and step up and, and be serving and be a part of what God is doing in this area that he's called us to have influence. Uh, in your notes here, I want to talk to you about the seven streams of influence. And this is based on a, well, it was a God meeting between two really generals in the faith, just giants in Christianity, uh, 
You may have heard of Lauren Cunningham. He was the founder of Youth with a Mission, if you've ever heard of that ministry. Uh, and a man named Bill Bright. He founded Campus Crusade. And just both these guys, God used to reach thousands and even millions of people with the gospel. And in 1975, so this account is almost 50 years ago, they were happening to be in the same city ministering at the same day, and they said, let's meet up for lunch. You know, they're both so busy. They, they knew one another, loved one another, but served in so many ways. Didn't, life didn't slow down that much. So they said, while we're in town together, let's have lunch. The night before, they were to meet each other for just their lunch uh, meetup. God showed both of them a vision to share with the other one. And it was so specific and so real, they actually wrote it down. And he showed them seven things, and miraculously, when they presented them, they were the exact same seven things that God had revealed to these two men. No way the other one could have known. These were what they, well, they, they initially coined them the seven mountains of influence. It got changed later to the seven streams of influence. That God showed them these are the things that are influencing society and the world and culture and y'all, we say we want to change the world. These are the things that, that are methods. They are vehicles of change in our society, in our world. So I want you to pay very close attention because there are seven of them. And unfortunately, at least six of them right now are predominantly being controlled by the wrong kingdom, by the kingdom of darkness and not the kingdom of God. And we as the church should... Take initiative. We should, we should feel this burden. We should feel this responsibility that all this ain't the government's fault. All this ain't society's fault. We have a calling, and if we're not doing what we're called to do, we shouldn't be surprised that the enemy continues to do what he's trying to do. Amen? So these areas of influence should be important to us. And I, I want to tell you, God told me to say this. There are influences in this place and in the body of Christ. You are an influencer whether you realize it or not. Many of you are already making a difference with your life, but I'm praying God will increase your faith as we read in the scripture and enlarge your influence. Some of you need to take that first step to say, this is not all about me anymore. God wants to use my life to be a life-changing life. Let me give you these areas. Uh, the first one is what we're doing right now. It's the church. Is a major influence in culture, in society. You can watch it all through human history. They'll call it different things, but religion and people's core beliefs influence all the decisions that the government makes. It all trickles down from there. And so many people are like, well, we need a separation. We just want church. You can be religious, but just keep that to yourself. And that's not what God's word says, but sometimes that's what the next one tries to tell us. The next area, uh, sphere, the next stream of influence is the government. And many times people will say, well, we need to separate the church and the government. If they'll pull that one up on the screen. The second one is government. And when we're talking about this, I want you to see we've got something backwards. The separation of the church and state is not supposed to be keeping the church out of influencing the government. It's supposed to be keeping the government from influencing the church. That's what it was designed for. And we're misusing it and have it completely backwards right now. And if we would understand that this is a place of influence, y'all, we need people of God serving in government. And I'm proud we have several in our church that serve in local capacity and in this way. But, man, if God leads you in that way, and, and we want to have influence on those that are in those areas. The next one is arts and education. Or, I'm sorry, arts and entertainment. These two kind of go together as one because the creative arts, the things that we consume for entertainment, whether you realize it or not, it has a big influence on your mind, big influence on your actions. It gets in there, man, and it sticks. Don't believe me? Let me prove it. I'm going to say something's not even words, and you're going to know the words to say, ba-da-ba-ba-ba. I'm loving it. That's exactly right. And it, those of you that don't know the McDonald's jingle, that was not a tongues and interpretation, okay? Uh, but... The, the reality is that it gets in your mind and other, other areas, and here's one I'm guilty of. It's not bad. I just want you to see how much this stuff gets ingrained in us. Something I'm passionate about, I'm excited about. You'll know the end of this phrase. How about them? All God's people said it. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. No, it's, it's true. How about them cowboys? You know, and 
man, these things, they influence us. We'll schedule our life around watching certain things or going to certain entertainment or, you know, listening to, to music. How many of you know listening to certain types of music will give you, make you feel a certain type of way? These things have big influence. So why is the church not having more influence in these areas? And I believe there are people in here that are called to be influencers in this area. The next one is the word education. I misspoke earlier, but this is a huge area of influence. And remember, y'all, this was 1975. Think of how different the education system is today. And they're they're influencing our most vulnerable, some of our most vulnerable, and our our most uh, just... They have endless possibilities, the younger generation. And I'm so glad for godly men and women who serve in our education systems. And we should pray for them. We try to support them and serve them. And and we want, uh, we've got several of you in here, and I'm so thankful for you and all that you, you have no idea. You have a ministry. The only hard part is your congregation is with you five days a week for eight hours a day. I'm glad y'all go home on Sundays. God bless you, teachers, and those in the education field. And these are areas that the church should recognize that we need to be interested in and influencing these areas. The next one is business. Business influences your business. It impacts the economy, what we can buy. It tries to impact how we value ourselves based on what we can afford. So this is a big area of influence, and I'm grateful for uh, men and women of God in our church and that have partnered with us that are successful in business, that they allow us to do the things that God has called us to do without having to beg for money. I'd say if if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be doing all the things that we're doing. And I've said this before, Iowa Park, Vernon, Wichita, Wilbarger County, y'all are making a big difference all across the world. And it's because of hardworking people uh, just like you that are are involved in in serving and, and being generous. The next one is the word media. And again, just think of the fact this was talked about 50 years ago before social media. They were talking about what an influence it had on people. And I want to tell you the truth. Media doesn't always tell the truth. So we need to be careful how much influence is it having. Make sure you know the word of God so that you'll know the difference between the truth of God's word and the lies they might be trying to spread uh, through the media. The final one is one of the most important, and that's the word family. You might be thinking, well, how does that shape society? That's just my little family, whatever. In human history, we have about 5,000 years of recorded human history. I'm a student of history. It fascinates me. One thing that fascinates me is how many times humans will make the same mistakes again and again and again and not learn from them. Something without fail that happens in the rise and fall of empires and and, uh, world powers is when they are at their peak, the family unit and marriage is the strongest that it it ever is. That's when those empires are the strongest that they ever are. And you know one of the first things to start to decay and decrease when you see the decline in a world power is the decline in the family. So again, this should be very serious for the church. And and we should take very seriously that these seven streams of influence, God gave these to these two men of God, and I'm sharing them with you today to know we shouldn't just sit here and be like, why is this happening? I'll tell you why a lot of it's happening. We're not involved enough in these areas of influence. We need to step up and go out and bring life to these areas where the enemy, I tell you, the devil's doing his job, so why ain't the church doing our job? We shouldn't be surprised when he's influencing these areas for darkness. So we need to shine the light of God. Remember what it said in Jeremiah 15, 19. You are to influence them. Don't let them influence you. So we don't just complain about things. We change things. Can I hear a good amen from anybody that believes that? That's what the body of Christ is called to do. Jesus said it in Matthew 5, verse 13. Listen to the words of Jesus. He said, you are the salt of the earth. I love salt. It makes everything better. Have you ever had popcorn without salt? Why would you do that? It's a mistake. Salt just makes things better. Now, let me differentiate something here for for a confusion that's happened in Christianity. He says you are the salt of the earth, not you need to go assault those in the earth. 
Because that's sometimes what we think Christianity is, is letting everybody know how bad they are. How ba- Y'all, they already know the world is broken. They know their lives are falling apart. And if they had not figured it out yet, they're going to find out real soon. Because sin is fun for a season. But how many of you realize seasons change? And you'll start to realize real, real quick, like, man, this is tearing me apart. So our job is not to tell them they're broken, but to show them there is one who can heal them. Salt doesn't come in and ruin things. It makes things better. Come on, somebody. But if salt loses its taste, Jesus says, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So if we're not changing the world, what good are we to the world? We've huddled together in our little buildings and we're just waiting on heaven. Jesus said, pray this way, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're not waiting to get to heaven to be bringing heaven to earth. That's what Jesus said. And so we need to take seriously our role to be a living influence. Matthew 5, 16, Jesus continues and says, in the same way, let your light shine before others. And did you know to... Let your light shine, you're going to have to do something. You got to turn it on. You got to uncover it. That's why it says, Let you. Jesus has done so much for us. Won't we do what he's asked us to do? He is the light. We just shine it so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And I promise you this we will win more people for the gospel's sake with the good news of Jesus Christ by doing the good works God has called us to do than just running our mouth about how bad everything is and how bad everyone is. That's what Jesus taught. That's not softening. Y'all, I preach against sin. I do. But here's the deal. God loves those that are trapped in sin. He's not trying to assault them. He wants us to be salt to them to help them see there's a better way. You don't have to live this way anymore. And so there are three important questions I want to submit to you just kind of in conclusion of this message about, okay, so what does this look like? You know, a lot of times in in church, I'm guilty of it. A lot of us, we know what we mean, but how many of you spouses know you you can think you explain something well to your spouse, but they heard something totally different, okay? Just side note, we have a marriage conference coming up in February. You may want to avail yourself of. Uh, We'll have more details on that real soon. But the truth is, we sometimes say things in church like, we need to change the world. Everybody's like, yeah, I want to change the world. What does that look like? I'm serious. What does it mean? We're going to change the world, and that feels too overwhelming. Okay, the the world is huge, and I'm just here in, you know, my little sphere of influence. And what, what what am I supposed to do? These three important questions will help give identity to what it is to, to be a living influence. So the first question we need to ask is why? Why are we doing this? Because I promise, if you don't come to grips with why you need to do this, you won't do it. You'll think it's not that important. So you need to understand why we do this. And I'll tell you the reason we do. Why, why do we want to change people's lives? Why do we, we want to be salt and light to people that are living in darkness? I'll tell you why. Because God loves them. He loves me so much. He did so much for me. And the Bible says, you know, yeah, God loves his church and he's coming back for his bride. But scripturally speaking, did you know the, the, that the Bible says God pays more attention to the lost than he does to the church? In fact, it actually says he is willing to leave the 99 to go find the one that is lost. Any of y'all ever lost something that was really important to you and you can't focus on all you can think of? It's like, I don't know where my kids are right now and I'm, I don't care because I got to find my car keys. They'll they'll fend for themselves, you know? Or my cell phone. Where's my cell phone? I've got to find. And the world stops until you find that phone. How much more so does our Heavenly Father pay attention to those who He created? And He didn't didn't make them to be addicts, He didn't make them to be victims of violence, He didn't make them to feel like their their life isn't worth living and then just be bogged down in depression and addiction and, and abuse and all those things. Why do we do this? Because those people are important to God and his eyes are watching for them and he's saying, here's how I'm going to reach them. I'm going to reach out my my hands and my feet through my children. I'm going to reach them through you. So why why do we be salt and light? Because God loves people. And I'll tell you, if you really say you love God, if you really love somebody, you love what they love. It's easy to, to like something when you already like it. 
It's real love to do something. Any men ever sat through a movie for your wife's sake and not your own? <laughs> Me too. Me too. Downton Abbey. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hebrews chapter... Th- That's not true. I didn't watch it. <laughs> I, I was praying. I was resting my eyes while Victoria was watching it. Anyway, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16. Are we signed up for that marriage conference, babe? Good. <laughs> It says in Hebrews 13, and do not forget to do good and share with those in need. And it's easy to sometimes just focus on what God's done for you, that you're saved, sanctified, man, blessed. We have healing in Jesus' name. He's he's just with us through it all. He never leaves us, never forsakes us. But don't just focus so much on what you're, the blessing you're receiving from God that you forget to do something with that blessing. Don't forget to do good and share. As I promise, God will give you more than you need so that you can give to those in need. And the Bible says in that next part of that verse, these are the sacrifices that please God. And I'm I'm proud that Hannah teaches this to our worship team. This kind of sacrifice, this living sacrifice, this is real worship, the Bible says. It's not just coming to a building and singing together once a week. That's beautiful. We need to do that. There's value in that. But if you really want to know what pleases God, more than singing songs about him, he wants you to live your life for him. And this is in part how you do it. This is the why. The second part, God is so wonderful that the second part is for you. That while you're helping others, it says in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 that you are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do these good works which God prepared in advance for you to do. He already had this planned out for you. So you might feel like, well, I just don't have any purpose. Yes, you do. You just haven't discovered it yet. God had it created for you long before you were ever born. And we need to discover it. And I'm going to be, I want to be very uh, gentle, but very, very real with you. I don't know who I'm talking to, but the Holy Spirit wants me to say it this way to you. There are those of us in this room, you're not real happy with your life. You don't feel like it has much meaning or much purpose. And I want you to know that's not how this is supposed to work. That we've been told a lie. We've been so influenced by these other things of the world that we think, well, I've got to do this to be happy or I have to have this to, to have value. And you're not really living the full life that God wants you to live, to have the influence. You shouldn't be getting influenced by all these things and comparing yourself with anybody else. You're incomparable to God. You're important to him. And, and he, he has a plan and a purpose specific for you that he prepared in advance for you to do. And if you'll discover that, man, it, you won't have trouble getting out of bed in the morning. Isn't it weird how when you got to do something you don't want to do, you ever done this? You, you know you're dreading doing something the next day. It feels like you just lay your head on the pillow and you just wake right up and you're just like, my alarm's already going off. I don't even want to go to that. You got to drag yourself out of bed. But man, when I've got something that I want to do, I almost can't sleep. I'm so excited. I'm ready. When's it getting here? You know what I mean? That's the kind of life God really wants for us. So if we've established why we do this, let's talk about where. It's the second question. Where? Where do I put this into practice? Because this is not just something we want to say that we do. It's something we want to live out. And we always say that we want to change the world. Here's how I'll say it to you. If you will change your world and I'll change my world, we will change the world. Amen? That's how God designed it to work. And it says in Exodus chapter 4, a powerful example of Moses, who God wanted to use to do a great thing. And Moses felt unqualified. He said, I don't talk good. I I need somebody else to do this. And how am I going to do all all that you're wanting me to do? He was sending him to deal with Pharaoh and the most powerful ruler of the most powerful empire in the world and to set God's people free. And where did he start? Then the Lord said to him in verse 2, What is that in your hand? Some of y'all, you're saying, God, what do you want me to do? And he's saying, what's right in front of your face? What do you have that you can do right now? And a staff, Moses replied to the Lord. And so the Lord said, throw it on the ground. Look what happened when, when Moses was obedient. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake. And if there's ever been a scripture, this is my life verse, that it became a snake and he ran from it. That is my life verse right there. But y'all, so many of us, when God actually starts to do something big with the the little thing that he's entrusted us to do, we almost get scared of it. 
We don't know how to handle it. God had to teach Moses how to handle it. That's why you need to be discipled. And that's why we need one another to figure this out together. Be patient. It can be overwhelming, but man, God taught him how to control that, that anointing and that power. And, and he used him as his you know, just right-hand man to, to set God's people free. Galatians 6 verse 4, I love this in the message paraphrase. It says, make a careful exploration of who you are. Notice what it doesn't say. Spend all your time worrying about what your neighbor's doing. It says, make a careful explanation of who you are and the work you have been given, and then sink yourself into that. I want to share with you a quote, not in your notes, by just another hero in the faith, Helen Keller. And if anybody had an excuse, she was both blind and deaf. What's our excuse for not doing more for God? Listen to her words. She said, I am only one, but still, I am one. So she wasn't making an excuse because she was just one. She said, I cannot do everything, but I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do something that I can do. There's a lot of wisdom right there. Sometimes we think, well, I can't change the world, so I'm just not going to do anything. And again, if you'll change your world, your sphere of it, all, next, I can't wait for you to hear next week's message. It's going to be about your sphere of influence. It's going to be very personal to you. It's going to be one of the most personal messages we'll probably share about how you matter to God's plan and to God's kingdom. And so I challenge you, be here and bring someone. Because, yeah, we can't do everything, but that's not going to make me refuse to do what I can do. I love how we were singing out to the Lord, just we bring everything to the feet of Jesus. Isn't that powerful? That we can bring everything to the one who can do anything. So don't worry about doing it all. That's what you got God for. So now that we've answered why we do this and where we do this, I want to be real practical and ask the question, how? We probably don't do this enough in church, if I'm being honest with you. We, we, we like talk in theory, you know, and share metaphor and stories. And I mean, Jesus spoke in parables. There's, there's value to that. But Jesus also just lived this stuff out in front of people. They saw him doing these things. And I tried to just a little bit last week share with you just some basic biblical habits that I live out in my daily life to kind of get rid of some of the mystique of, of this. How do, how do you, you know, live a life that influences others? How do you live a life-changing life? Proverbs chapter 3 is a great example of it. It says, never walk away from someone who deserves help. <laughs> Sorry, I tried to prepare myself better. Uh, this just gets to me because I, I replay. Do you ever replay memories of things you wish you'd have done differently? And I'll just, I'll just confess to you. I have on too many occasions been so busy trying to do church that I've passed people by that needed me to be the church. I haven't returned a phone call or haven't gone and seen somebody and I failed them in that moment. But I'm glad that God never fails, that he has other ways to reach people, but I wanna be a part of his plan. The Bible says right here that your hand is God's hand for that person. So let us, as the hands and feet of Jesus, not walk away from someone who deserves help. I'm not talking about somebody manipulative or whatever, no, but, but I will tell you this, God helped me when I didn't deserve it. So I'm usually the one that's gonna err on the side of helping you anyway. And if you take advantage of me, that's okay. God's the one taking care of me. Amen? That's between you and God. And you have no idea the influence that you walk past every day. Remember, the enemy of love, we want to show love to the world. The enemy is being in a hurry. It's hard to be in love and in a hurry at the same time. It goes on to say, never tell your neighbors to wait until tomorrow. Because listen to the last part. Don't wait until tomorrow if you can help them now. Why not now? Why not today? I want to challenge you. Some of you may 
go to a restaurant or go to the store later today. Don't miss an opportunity. Sometimes we're like, I wish God would just show me what he wants me to do with my life. He is. Look around. There's this broken people everywhere. Jesus said, go seek and save that which is lost. You want to be like Jesus? Do what Jesus did. As he was going, the Bible says, he would just pray with people. He would just love people. He would take time to talk to them and then take time to listen to them. And he was never too busy. If Jesus, if anybody had a purpose that he needed to get to and do, he put it off for 33 years so he could walk among us, live life with us, and share love to us. So if you can help somebody, I had an encounter with a gentleman at a restaurant a few weeks ago. And I don't know, I I should do it more. I just, God put on my heart to talk to him and he was in a hurry and he said, I I said, how are you? And he goes, man, I'm busy, busy. I was like, yeah, but how how are you? And he kind of stopped and I watched him, you know, kind of fight back tears like I'm doing right now because I almost didn't talk to him because I thought it'd be awkward. And he, he just very, very gently began to tell me about troubles going on with his kids and he's trying to, you know, make ends meet. And I just got to pray with that guy, love, love him. And then, then I, I left him a generous tip because I want him to know I put my money where my mouth is. And I don't tell you that to brag on myself, y'all. I, you know, I got four kids to feed. I, but I'll, I'll tell you something that I've seen God do miraculously. I have never been able to outgive God. And people have poured back into my life way more than I can ever pour out. So if we'll start living this kind of life, it'll change our life. Absolutely. Now, Isaiah 58, the final scripture I'm going to leave you, but I've got one final thought I'll share in a moment. I want you to write down. It's not in your notes. You don't have a blank for it, but I want you to remember it. God just put it on my heart for you, if you'll hang on for that. This scripture says in verse 10, And if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed then your light will rise in the darkness and I know the world's getting dark but church don't let that influence us don't let that cause us to stop doing what God's created us to do and called us to do don't let it cause us to start being so cynical that we stop loving people again I don't care if they take advantage of us as long as we know who's taking care of us because the Bible says right here in many other places as the world grows darker then the light of Jesus Christ can shine brighter than ever before through you and me Jesus called us the light of the world and that will light this earth like the noonday. It goes on to say, and the Lord will guide you always and he will satisfy, look at that, he will satisfy your needs. That's what my faith is in. That if we'll do what God's called us to do, God will take care of us. And if you will live that out, it will change the way you live your life. You're not just living to survive, you're living for the cause of Christ. He will satisfy your needs even in a sun-scorched land. It was almost like he was writing in North Texas. And he will strengthen your frame and you will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Praise God. The last thing I want you to write down is just a final thought. You say, how do I do this? Simple. Find a need and fill it. Find a hurt and heal it. We are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. One day at a time, one step at a time, one life at a time. If you will change your world, I can't do it all. I'm not supposed to. Neither are you. Don't put too much of a burden on yourself. Do what is before you. Don't miss the ones you love the most because you're trying to do the most. Even in for them, you think. Don't let the enemy steal all your time with them because you think you got to keep up with what everybody else is doing. Find a need, fill it. Find a hurt and heal it. I want to ask everybody to stand, please. All over this place, and and if you're watching online, I'm going to ask you to do something as well. I just kind of want to show you what this looks like in a very tangible way. If you're here today and you have a need in your life, in your heart, your, your emotions are, are wounded, you're, you're, you're stressed, you're depressed, whatever it might be, you've got a need, I want you to know that you're loved, that God loves you. And I want to show that to you in a very real way. 
If you're here and you say, man, I, I, I could use prayer for a situation going on in my life or just a burden that I'm carrying in my heart. If that's you, would you raise your hand real high for just a moment? Would everybody look around? Keep your hand up, please. Would anybody and everybody who is faith-filled and willing and, and loves God and loves people, will you go find somebody that's got their hand raised? Prayer team, move, please. Lead the way, but y'all move. Let, let's, let's just be the church. Don't let anybody be alone. Look, there's people over here in the back. There's people to the sides. Find somebody with their hand up. If you have to, just stretch your hand that way. Just be, just be there with them and, and just pray for them. I want you just to pray as the Spirit leads you and just speak life over them. You know what? You don't even have to know their problem to know that they are loved and that Jesus is the solution. So if you're comfortable and you want to share with somebody there, you do that. And if not, let's just all pray right now. Let's be the church for one another. And then you know what? You can do the same thing at Walmart or a restaurant later. But I'm going to speak over you life and believe for God to heal your wounded heart. Believe for God to give you strength in your body if you need it. He can work a, a miracle in your, in your money, in your finances. He wants you to be blessed with more than enough so that you can be a blessing to others. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak your plan over these, your people. God, I reject and rebuke every lie of the enemy that might have told them you, you've, been, you've put it off too long or you've prayed about it before and it didn't get answered. I reject all that right now. And I declare the truth that you are God, you are more than able, and you are alive and you're working in this place right now. So I declare that cancer has to dissolve and go right now in the name of Jesus. I declare that, that heart disease is healed, that people that have battled depression, every harassing spirit, you have to leave my family alone in the name of Jesus. And they're gonna have the most peace and rest they've ever had in their life. I declare it over you. I speak it over you. I, 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 I just share with you, you don't have to carry a burden that you are not meant to carry. Give it to God. Do not feel like you are an addict. You are a victim anymore. You are brand new in Jesus' name. And so you walk around with your head held high and you live that life God called you to live. You aren't the one that qualified you to do it in the first place. So nothing you've done has disqualified you from what Jesus has called you and created you to do. So I just declare you to be salt and light, free from pain and burden and sickness and shame. In the name of Jesus and all who believe and receive that said, Glory to God. Would somebody give him glory in this place? We praise you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Amen. Man, and when, notice I didn't say if, when God changes your life, testify of it. Tell somebody. We sang that today. This is my testimony from death to life. Can anybody in this place just raise your hand and say, God has changed me. I'm not who I used to be, and I don't plan on ever going back. So let's go out and tell other people the good news of Jesus Christ. I, I'm going to pray a blessing over you, and I'm going to dismiss you. But I'm going to challenge you that wherever you go today, that's where Jesus is. Because you have Christ in you. Be Jesus everywhere that God leads you. Amen? And let's live a life-changing life. Heavenly Father, I thank you for my family that you love so dearly. I just pray protection over them. I pray encouragement for them. Those that are, that are tired, let them know it's because they've been trying hard and you're proud of them. And give them supernatural strength and energy right now in the name of Jesus. And send us out. Let us be salt and light that changes things for the better and drives out darkness. In the almighty name of Jesus Christ, I declare it. And all God's people said, amen. 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 God bless you, church. Go with God. If you're sticking around, hang out for the life group training. And I'd love to see you tomorrow at 6 a.m. for 21 days of prayer. I love you. Go, go with God and go be Jesus wherever he leads.